Ah. Uh, well, uh, I... Th from, from quite early on, I mean... Uh, early childhood, really, I, I, I found writing easy. I found... I found putting pa pen to paper quite easy. Um, I'd formed an interest in military history earlier than I can remember, really. My father had been a soldier in the First World War. I was growing up in the Second World War, uh, in a part of Britain where the American army was gathering to invade Normandy, so I had this spectacle of a gigantic military force before my eyes at all times. Um, and then when I started to grow up, when I was going to university, uh, having to choose what I was going to study, military history seemed the obvious thing to settle on. And I did indeed study military history as a special subject at Oxford. Um, and then when I went out into the world, when I left Oxford and having to think about a job, I thought, well, would it be possible to get a job as a military historian? And to my surprise, I found that there indeed were a few openings in military history. One of them was at Sandhurst, which is Britain's military academy, Britain's West Point. And I did get a job there, and I did uh, then spend a long time, a large portion of my life, at Sandhurst, it professionally employed as a military historian, and beginning to write about it. That's how I became a writer. Well, of course, I think much more so curiously in Britain than it does in America, because there's been a terrific row about the role of intelligence in getting Britain into the war in Iraq, which, which I don't think there has been in, in the US. In Britain, where there's strong opposition to the war, uh, those who oppose it say that Tony Blair, the Prime Minister, took Britain into war on a, on a false or a biased intelligence report having to do with the chemical weapons, the, the weapons of mass destruction threat. And it sparked the most dreadful uh, political crisis. Uh, th there's a judicial inquiry. The Prime Minister has had to appear in court. It's a, almost the same sort of uh, atmosphere as you get in, in America if there's danger of impeachment of the President. Uh, and it's all to do with intelligence. So intelligence has been very, very crucial in Britain's part in, in, in going to war in Iraq. I think less so in the US, but nevertheless, in the US too, the president said he had to, he had to take, take the US forces to the Gulf to deal with Saddam, because Saddam threatened the use of weapons of mass destruction in his neighborhood and further afield. And that was all based on intelligence assessments. I was born in, um, in London. Um, I was born in Cedars Road, Clapham. I can see uh, where I was born on the train going up to London from where I live now. Um, and uh, I was, as was common then, you know, I was born in a little nursing home. But I didn't live, my parents didn't live far away. And we stayed in London until 1939, the outbreak of war, when we went down to the country and, and spent the whole of the war in the country, very near where I live now. Uh, then in Somerset, now in Wiltshire, but perhaps only 50 miles apart. 2000, the Millennium Honours List 2000. You... You, well, you, you put Sir in front of your name. You become, I became Sir John Keegan, which is rather uncomfortable. And then you forget about it, I think, quite quickly. You go to the palace, uh, Buckingham Palace. Uh, you wait in, in line with lots of other people who've got medals or 
decorations, and when the time comes, you go go forward. The queen taps you on the shoulder with a sword, and um, you become, in my case, Sir John Keegan. Yes. yes, I think so. I mean, in my village, I live in a little in a little farming village. Um, everybody continues to call me John, as they've always done. Uh, uh, I think the only the only people who who pay attention are the um, middle-aged personal assistants of important men who are scrupulously polite. They say, uh, may I speak to Sir John Keegan on the telephone? N nobody else bothers. In 1994, uh, Bill Clinton was coming to Europe as president to uh, take part in the 50th anniversary ceremonies for D-Day. And he asked a group of historians, uh, including me, to go to the White House and brief him about what he should say at the various locations. Uh, the other five were Americans. I was the only non-American there. So, of course, first of all, it was a tremendous honor to be asked to the White House. Secondly, of course, it was a tremendous interest because uh, I'd never met a president. I'd never. Uh, been in the White House, I'd never seen how the White House worked. Uh, and then it was personally interesting about Bin Bill Clinton, he, because he, he conducted the thing very, very competently. He said to, uh, he asked each person uh, um, uh, who was an expert on, on, on a different thing, what he should say about their expertise. Uh, he asked me uh, what I, as a, as a British citizen, thought. I said, well, don't forget the Canadians, because one of the three beaches was a Canadian beach, and they're extremely proud of it. And uh, I also said, don't forget the Poles, because the Poles played a heroic part in the culmination of the Battle of, uh, of Normandy. And um, he did, in fact, in his speeches, he did mention both the Canadians and the Poles, so perhaps my advice was useful to him. I was asked to go to, um, to Langley, to CIA headquarters. I'd met a CIA training officer uh, who'd said that he thought I could be useful in, in uh, talking to CIA trainees, training analysts. Um, so I went to see them once, and then they asked me to go again. And this time, when I arrived, uh, my escorting officer said, you're going to meet the director. And uh, we eventually found our way to William Casey's office, and I was taken in to meet him. And he, he began to speak to me, and I couldn't understand what he was saying. Uh, and I thought that he was, because uh, I was at that stage, uh, the defence correspondent of the London Daily Telegraph, I thought perhaps he was going to, going to convey some important uh, scoop or intelligence news to me. Uh, so I got closer and closer to him and eventually when I was almost sort of sitting on his desk, he, I realised that he was not talking to me about intelligence at all. He was talking to me about writing military history books because he himself was an author and he'd written, he gave me a copy. He'd written a book called uh, when and, uh, Where and How the War Was Fought. It was actually an excellent book about uh, relating the geography of the War of the Revolution to the modern road system of the United States and um, uh, describing the current state of the uh, War of the Revolution battlefields. Uh, but of course it was, I was slightly taken aback. I was th thinking that I was communicating at the highest level of intelligence and discovering that, it, that instead this was a conversation between fellow authors. When I got outside and there was a group of CIA officers waiting, I, I, I said, they said, what did he talk to you about? And I said, I couldn't really understand, of which they, there was a sort of collective outburst of laughter. And um, they then explained to me that he was known as Mumbles, uh, or the only man in Washington who doesn't need a secure telephone. He was notoriously incomprehensible. Well, it depends what you mean. Now, Kip Kipling, Rudyard Kipling, who was the 
I think one of the most imaginative of all uh, writers about war and soldiers only ever saw fighting once and then all he saw was a puff of smoke among trees in a sort of at a distance in during the Boer War in 1900 or 1901. Um, I have, of course, Stephen Crane, who wrote The Red Badge of Courage, generally regarded as the greatest of all war novels, uh, had never been near a war, and he afterwards admitted that all he knew about violence he'd learnt on the football field at Yale. Um, but no, I have... Um, I was in Lebanon in eight, 1994 at a very violent stage and there was a lot of shooting then and I, I, did, uh, I did see quite a lot of shooting and I, I'm, not going, I'm certainly not going to say I was shot at but I was shot over or shot near. Uh, what, I was shot over by the USS Missouri, which um, I was sitting uh, with a US liaison officer on the, head, uh, on the top floor of the Lebanon Ministry of Defence looking out to sea, and I suddenly saw clouds of smoke wreathing the enormous shape of the USS Missouri. Um, and I said, what's the Missouri doing? And he looked at it, he said, it's firing its main armament. Well, it was the, the first time that the, 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 the Sixth Fleet had intervened in the, in the war in Lebanon, which was a civil war, as you know. But at that moment, the USS Missouri, the most powerful battleship in the world, with its sister ships, had fired its 16-inch guns over our heads out into uh, the Shouf Mountains to um, deter, I think, the Druze from... Uh, attacking the legitimate government. We have exactly the same response in our country. Um, and I find I'm constantly being asked to write articles for newspapers uh, on this theme. Should, uh, or oh, is Britain's foreign policy skewed by the fact that we, our current generation of politicians has not only never been to war, but not usually been in the army. They, they were, they, they're too young to have uh, had to uh, obey the draft. And that's true. And, of course, it is true in, 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 in this country, too, with, the, with, the, with odd exceptions. Donald Rumsfeld was a, was a Navy pilot. Uh, not in war, I think, but um, he certainly knows about flying on and off carriers, which is a pretty dangerous occupation. Uh, I, I haven't been to war, except I've been to wars as, chorus, as a correspondent. Uh, I haven't been a soldier. On the other hand, I spent 25 years uh, as a teacher at Santos, which are, is our West Point, our military academy. I lived side by side with soldiers for 25 years of my life. I know how they think, I know what they talk about. I, uh, I have no difficulty at all in, in understanding soldiers. That, that's really answering your question about historians rather than about politicians. But as far as I'm concerned, I, I don't feel I'm unqualified. I feel, in fact, that I'm very qualified simply because of this intimacy that I've had with soldiers. Unusual, difficult to get. Um, I do find that historians who haven't had some intimate contact with the armed forces and write about war lack something. Politicians? Well, the one thing nobody ever said about Mrs Thatcher was that uh, she was unqualified to send our soldiers and sailors to the Falklands in 1982 because she hadn't been in the forces. I mean, what everybody said about Mrs Thatcher was what an absolutely remarkable war leader she was. As, curiously, women I won't say often, but when women do have to serve as war leaders, 
curiously, they often make very, very good ones. I mean, Mrs. Thatcher was outstandingly good. Mrs. Indira Gandhi of India was a, was a, a very determined war leader, uh, and so on. So, no, I don't think it, I don't think it's a disqualification uh, in the post-war generation, which is in charge now, that there's a lack of direct knowledge of what war is like. It said that the most important emotion in war is fear, but um, the, the thing to remember about soldiers is not that they're being brave or, or that they're being heroic, but <laughs> they're feeling extremely frightened uh, and that uh, uh, most soldiers, uh, I think, when they tell the truth about their experience of war, will tell you that they were frightened the whole time. Curiously, I think one of my recent books, The, the First World War, to my... I wrote about it because uh, my father was in the First World War. I'm, like most British people, I'm fascinated by the First World War. Killed so many of our fellow citizens. Um, uh, but I, I wrote it simply because I wanted to write it. I, I, I said to my publisher, well, I'm afraid it won't sell very well in America. I have a huge American readership, so that was rather an imp important consideration. But I was quite wrong. It sold tremendously well in the United States. It sold, I think, nearly 200,000 copies in the United States. And uh, I think that there has developed, I don't think it was there 20 years ago, 30 years ago, but there, ha uh, there has developed an extraordinary interest in the First World War in the United States. Why, it's difficult to say. I, uh, it's, uh, of course, the, the American Civil War and the First World War have similarities. They were both terrible social experiences, frightfully costly in blood, uh, left uh, huge uh, consequences of all sorts. And I think that th those similarities ha have become apparent to Americans, and maybe that's part of the explanation, but I don't think it's the whole explanation. I think this growing American interest in the First World War is, is very mysterious, but interesting. Sure. Uh, why did Germany stop the offensive in 1914? Um, the, the Germans have agonised over that a very great deal. Of course, the Germans had expected to win outright and quickly in 1914. Uh, they thought they'd encircle the French army and force it to surrender in the open field. They didn't. Uh, the, the French army staged a counteroffensive at the Battle of the Marne, and the Germans found themselves retreating. Um, and uh, the High Command sent an emissary, Lieutenant Colonel Hench, to see what the situation was and to give advice. And Hench, more or less on his own authority, said they had to stop retreating, uh, there was no point in hoping to stage a counter-offensive of their own, and they'd better dig in where they were and so they did. They dug in on what was then to become the line of the Western Front for the next four years. So that's why they stopped the offensive, because Colonel Hench told them to stop the offensive. Uh, the, the second point about why didn't the Allies occupy Germany, I think, I think because they knew that if they pushed the Germans too far, the armistice might break down. The, um, the German army had not been defeated in the field, as we were to be reminded many, many times in the subsequent years. It was, after all, the, the, the theme of Hitler's uh, appeal to the Germans. We were an undefeated army, and yet we were humiliated as a nation. Um, we, this is intolerable. We must do something about it. In 1918, I, I think the Allies felt that if they... Uh, if they tried to occupy the whole of Germany, then the Germans would turn, would recover their fighting spirit and would force the Allies to fight a war at a disadvantage 
uh, deep in the interior of Germany, and so uh, they only went as far as the Rhine. Sure, um, I'm delighted to answer that question. I, I know Paul Fussell well. He's a friend of mine. He's visited me in England. I visited him in the United States. And uh, Paul Fussell's Great War in Modern Memory is rightly regarded as uh, one of the most important uh, books of the second half of the 20th century, both as a, a piece of military history, which it is in a way, uh, but also as a work of highly perceptive literary criticism, which it is also. It's a remarkable book. It straddles two cultures, two disciplines, and it does so in a brilliant way. Um, it was a, an enormous success, both uh, um, commercially and critically, and it deserved to be so. And what I think Paul was so clever uh, at was in relating what people said about the war, what writers like Robert Graves or Siegfried Sassoon said about what had happened to them as people to the objective experience. Paul knew the writers intimately. Well, he's a professor of English literature and lots of professors of English literature know writers intimately, but what was really striking about Paul's treatment was that he also knew the history of the First World War intimately, so he could put the two together in a, in a very, very uh, uh, connected way. And that's why the book has always been so popular and is deservedly popular. Uh, he uh, used to live in, in um, uh, New Jersey and teach in Philadelphia, I think. I, but I think he's retired now. This is a very sensitive and difficult subject. David Irving is, of course, the... Uh, he is the author of a number of books uh, uh, of different themes, one of which... It's called Hitler's War, uh, of which, like many other modern historians, I'm a great admirer, um, because it's an... It, as Lord Dacre, uh, Hugh Trevor Oakeper said, it's as if... it's as if Hitler had written an autobiography. That, that, that's the quality that uh, David Irving's Hitler's War has. But nevertheless, he's a highly controversial figure. He's, he's uh, condemned for what appear to be pro-Nazi and anti-Semitic positions. Uh, I was uh, forced to give evidence in his trial um, two years ago, I think. Uh, I, he, he asked me if I would give, ev give evidence, and I said, no, I would not. Uh, he then issued a subpoena, which is a legal device, which uh, means that the, the person on whom it's served has to appear in court. Uh, and so I was obliged to go to court court and to give evidence, that's to say to answer his questions, which I did, um, and I then wrote an account of my experience in court uh, in which uh, I tried to explain what I felt had happened, and I did indeed say that I thought Deborah Lipstadt was a rather boring writer and uh, didn't have anything original to say, whereas, of course, Irving, for all his faults, for all his faults, is not a boring writer. Uh, it came out in... Uh, it, on the Second World War, 1939, 1980. It came out in 1989, on the 50th anniversary of the outbreak of the, the Second World War. And I think it sold very well in the United States, not very well in England, uh, not as well in England, because Many people wrote books to commemorate the outbreak of the Second World War in England, one of whom was Martin Gilbert. And uh, his book and mine were published almost simultaneously, but his slightly ahead of mine, and it did better. And quite justifiably, Martin is a wonderful historian and a most charming man, and um, I don't in any way... Uh, I bear no grudge at all. Well, that, that, that's a very thoughtful question, one much increasingly discussed, uh, I think, both in Europe and America. Um, and there is a great deal of reason to think that had Germany restrained itself, uh, that it would 
uh, incrementally have uh, gained more and more power over the continent of Europe. It was the second largest economy in the world by then. The Britain was overtaken as the world's largest economy in 1870. Uh, and in 1914, of course, the United States was by far the largest economy in the world, followed by Germany, with Britain third. Um, uh, and in terms of coal, steel and iron production, Germany greatly outstripped Britain and all other European countries. It also, for example, and this is often forgotten or not known at all, is it had the second largest commercial fleet in the world. The British always proud at the time and proud to remember that in 1914 the British Merchant Navy uh, of 20 million tonnes of uh, merchant shipping was by far the largest merchant navy and that was why they needed the enormous uh, um, Royal Navy that they had to protect it. But we forget that the Germans had the second largest and a very, very considerable fleet it was too. So I think in these ways, both as a producing nation and as a trading nation, Germany was very, very powerful and getting more powerful in 1914. And had they, had they been able to restrain themselves from going to war, I think uh, simply, I think you're right, I think simply by sort of natural, uh, natural increase, they, they would have come to dominate the continent. It's a bit theological, this. Um, uh, it's very like the sort of arguments you get inside uh, uh, churches about points of uh, uh, dogma or teaching. Um, my criticism of Clausewitz, who is the, you know, universally recognised as the most important thinker, theoretical thinker about war that has ever lived, is that he... Uh, overemphasizes the political element in war. Uh, I don't think that uh, uh, Clausewitzians, people who follow Clausewitz, tend to say that all wars have a have a political cause and purpose. I don't think that's true. I think that uh, uh, the inner nature of war. Uh, is it a le is it is it, it is a sort of at a even more profound level than the political, uh, and I like to say that it's if you need to give it a name, that it's anthropological. It has to do with the nature of man himself, not with the nature of how he organises his public life, um, because you can have a perfectly good war with uh, high levels of commitment on both sides and frightful carnage and no, in fact, no objective uh, p political input at all. Well, thank you, that's very flattering of you. Um, I think I tend to, from somewhere or other, uh, an idea f comes to the surface and stays there for uh, a time and if it stays there long enough you think, well, I really must write a book about this. Um, I think that's where the impetus to, to, to write comes from. And sometimes the idea sort of stays for a time and then goes away and you, you, you feel, oh, well, that m might have worked, but I don't think it would really because I didn't feel committed enough to it. When you've decided to get to work, curiously, uh, I always, the, the way I begin to approach a subject, uh, I, I always try and think of key events which epitomise uh, the period or the subject that I'm writing about. Um, for example, in the face of battle, I, I took three battles, each of which seemed to me to epitomise a particular moment in the development of warfare. Um, and I analyse the events in terms of, always, in terms of a number of quite material um, 
factors. One of these is uh, geography, the location, what, what, what the, the terrain was like, how the terrain would have influenced the combatants on, on each side. And another is, which I think is absolutely fundamental and I spend a great deal of time with, is what is called the order of battle. That's to say making an exact list of who was involved so that you... It's a bit like doing accounts in business. Uh, you know, businessmen say that unless the accounts are straight, uh, they, uh, they, they cannot be certain that their business is on being conducted on sound lines. I always say that unless you've got a, an exact order of battle and you know how many, for example, at, at, uh, at Waterloo, how many uh, French units there were and how many British and Allied units there were on, on each side and know exactly their strength and their position and uh, who, the, who commanded them, that you, you can't do the account of the battle, the, literally the account in both senses. You can't do the story of the battle and you can't do the... Uh, the, the bill correctly. So, and it's only afterwards, I think, only after the, that I've done those things that I begin to think about the more imaginative, uh, less material aspects. Well, I know the book you mean, um, uh, and I think his general argument has a great deal in it. Uh, the, the German army was the most professional fighting force in, in the world in 1914, and it kept up its level of professionalism throughout the First World War. Um, I think he then rather mishandles his argument because uh, he, at he attaches great importance, or as a, as a sort of demonstration of, of what he means. He, he, um, he does a great deal of analysis of, about the fighting for a, a, a mountainous position called the, the hartmann weilers um down... Uh, on the Franco-German border near Switzerland, or known to the French as Le, Le Vieil Armand. Um, and he points out that time and again the Germans, because they had highly trained mountain troops, uh, were much more successful than the French at, uh, at contesting this high ground. But, in fact, mountain warfare is very, very specialised. Nobody's ever won a war by superiority in mountain warfare, and I think he rather threw his argument away by moving from a good general point to an interesting but rather unimportant specialised point. All right, both very good questions, if I may say so. The Ballantine series uh, um, began to appear, I think, in the, in the 1960s. They were... Uh, there were about a hundred of them. Um, they were published in the US by Ballantine Books. They were edited in Britain by a remarkable man called Barry Pitt. Um, uh, the, uh, the formula was, well, as far as the author was concerned, the formula was standard. You had to write, I think, about thirty to 40,000 words, for which you were paid a flat fee of $1,000. Now, to somebody in his 20s, recently married with babies uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the cot, a thousand dollars cash on the barrel seemed very, very uh, attractive indeed. And Barry Pitt got a whole lot of what were to be in the future very well-known writers to take on these titles for Valentine books. For example, uh, 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 he got Paul Kennedy, um, uh, the, uh, the author of The Rise and Fall of the Great Powers, uh, and a professor at Yale, was then a, a, a struggling young academic as I was to join the team, and numbers of other, what, who, numbers of other people who were to become well-known and serious writers were struggling away for Barry Pitt, uh, turning out these, these short, uh, quick books uh, for cash. The odd thing is that uh, not only was the formula attractive to the writers, it also produced rather good books. Some of those Ballantine books remain, although considering the conditions in which they were produced, they remain extremely good accounts of the subjects they're devoted to. And, and uh, you're not the only person who, who reminds me that I was once a Ballantine books author, and I'm, not the, I'm, I'm delighted to acknowledge that I was.
And sorry, my favourite war movie. I'd, I'm in the. That, I don't think I'm the only military historian would say so. I don't like war movies. Um, what's going on in Iraq is. Uh, it seems the newspapers. Uh, and it's more the newspapers than the television, really. The newspapers manage to make it look uh, gloomy, terrible, unprecedented, etc. I don't think it is. I think that uh, typically wars always end with a rather mitty... Or typically... It, it, it has been typical for, for wars in the past to have ended in a messy and difficult way. The Western outlook, particularly in the United States and Britain, was wrongly affected by the end of the, the Second World War, both the First World War and the Second World War, particularly the Second World War, when the Germans and the Japanese suddenly laid down their arms. On a certain day, they laid down their arms and they gave no trouble thereafter. The, the Allies occupied their countries, uh, overturned their governments, brought in new constitutions um, and directed both uh, former combatant states on, into entirely new paths. And we think that was normal. In fact, it was highly abnormal. It's about the only time in history that it's ever happened, I think. You know, end of war, total end of resistance and a new start. Uh, and the newspapers, uh, and to a certain extent the television, are now arguing that that is what should have happened in Iraq. But it would have been most unusual if it had happened. And uh, this continued scrappy resistance by uh, followers, surviving followers of Saddam and by ex-members of the Ba'at Party, I think is far more typical of what usually happens at the end of the war than uh, 1945 was. Uh, well, I am on st I'm on the staff of the Daily Telegraph. I write whenever the editor tells me to write. I, in fact, I, of course, had a very great deal of work to do um, during the Gulf War, since when he's been rather kind, and I haven't had to write very much. Well, uh, it's a difficult question to answer because the death of this unfortunate scientist who committed suicide, or appears, appears to have committed suicide, uh, Kelly, Dr David Kelly, uh, is now the subject of a high-level judicial inquiry uh, and the judge, Lord Hutton, has not yet reported and won't report, I think, until early in the new year. So we, we do not know what uh, judgment he will come to. Um, there's, been, there's been endless speculation about why Dr, Dr. Kelly committed suicide. My my view was that he was a career civil servant uh, and because of the, as a result of his involvement with the press which is forbidden or was uh, traditionally been forbidden to civil servants he was threatened with disciplinary action by the civil service and got into a panic and committed suicide but this is rather an individual view of mine. Others don't accept it. Others say that it was the pressure that the media put upon him or the pressure that Parliament put upon him that caused him to take his own life. Um, we won't know what the official verdict is until Lord Hutton reports. I think it will be accepted because Lord Hutton uh, has established himself as a figure of great authority and trust in British life by the way he's conducted the inquiry so far. Well, I think I'd, I think I'd need to have the questions qualified rather. I, uh, uh, I, I mean, to who, to whom were these lives more important? Clearly, the lives of Chinese civilians were not important to the Japanese high command. Uh, uh, the, the Japanese high command regarded China simply as a, a place from which uh, Japan's means of livelihood should be extracted. And right at the end of the war, in 1944 in particular, they were conducting uh, what were called the rice offensives, which were fought to extend the area of Jap Japanese occupation and capture uh, bigger areas of, the, uh, of, of, of rice, pro rice, rice production. Um, taking rice from China 
calls the death of millions of Chinese, and the Japanese didn't care about that. Um, I would have thought that the, 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 the American high command was, uh, um, was concerned about the lives of the Chinese. They were, after all, the Chinese were our allies. Um, but was less concerned about the lives of Japanese civilians who were, uh, were being bombed by, by the US Army Air Force as a means of uh, shortening Japan's resistance. So I think it depends, you know, you have to define who, who, you, who was caring about whom or it, not. Uh, yes, I, I know, I mean, uh, I'm in the odd position of being, what well, I like to think, on, on terms of good friendship with uh, the proprietor of the newspaper of which I'm an employee. Um, and I did, in fact, I have read and annotated portions of this enormous life of, of Franklin Delano Roosevelt that uh, Conrad Black has written, uh, which I think is awfully good. Conrad is a most unusual newspaper proprietor in that he's a genuine intellectual. Um, I don't think most newspaper proprietors are intellectuals, but Conrad is. He's interested in ideas. And um, uh, he's also immensely knowledgeable. And one of the things that he's uh, really knowledgeable about. He's American, American, not because he's a Canadian, but he's a, he's a sort of, he's, he's born a Canadian, he's become a British citizen, he has residences in the United States, and he's a great expert on American politics. And I must say, the passages in his life uh, of FDR about uh, New Deal politics before the war and about uh, FDR's wartime politics are absolutely fascinating. I think he deals, he's got a real understanding of how the politics of that era worked. Well, I, I, I think he had reason to be. Um, the, the, both the British and the French took a rather patronising attitude towards this enormous army of untrained soldiers who appeared in France in 1917. Uh, the American, uh, the American government and the American armed forces, had, uh, by extraordinary efforts, uh, both of, of intellect and organisation, managed to uh, transform the war situation. Um, but the, the 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 soldiers who crossed the Atlantic were not, it has to be said, were not well trained. Uh, and the British, the French less so, the British said, well, look, you give us uh, blocks of these raw recruits of yours and we will put them into our divisions, into our uh, formations, and we will use them as reinforcements and replacements. And by serving alongside our soldiers, they will learn how to... Uh, to fight, uh, the, the Amer particularly Pershing, the, 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 the American Expeditionary Force commander said, absolutely not. I am commanding a unified American army under American command and I am not having foreigners, British or French generals, telling, telling my soldiers what to do. And he got his way. Um, and I think he was absolutely right to do so. Uh, it, it was not a proper role for these Americans to, to serve as replacements in foreign units. And uh, the, the, the Doughboys, in fact, learnt tremendously quickly and they fought with a, 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 amazing courage and eventually remarkable efficiency as well. So uh, um, I'm on the side of Pershing. Oh, well, of course, this horrible disease has now largely disappeared. Um, used to be a, a scourge of European and American life. Um, uh, you could get it in the lungs, which consumption, which, uh, and you could get it in the bones. Uh, I got it in the in the bone, and it. Um, I had to spend several years in hospital as a result, and then I made a wonderful recovery. And for during my twenties and thirties and forties and fifties, I was fit as a flea and leapt about the place and went all over the world and went to wars and uh, did all that sort of thing. But um, in my sixties. Um, things started to catch up on me and I began to uh, limp very badly and to have difficulty in getting about. And now, 
uh, an orthopaedic surgeon has said, well, I, you know, you've got to the stage where I must uh, insert re artificial hips uh, and, and a knee as well. I think I have to have three of these replacement operations. Uh, February, I'm going to have the first on February the 4th. Uh, I, I, he, she, it's a lady, she says that uh, I, there's every chance that I will be um, um, agile again. And I, I believe her. Uh, thank you very much. I got the second point. I didn't get the first point. Who, uh, the, who did he say shouldn't have entered the First World War? The second point, uh, I, uh, indeed, it, it, you can't disagree with it. The, the British, uh, it, it is largely the British, not the French, did maintain, did sustain the blockade of Germany uh, after the Germans had entered into the armistice. Um, specifically, precisely, to force them to sign. And this uh, was a matter of, this was caused great bitterness in Germany. They said, we uh, accepted Wilson's 14 points, we've laid down our arms, we are ready to make peace, but it should be a just and honourable peace, uh, uh, and, and not one dictated to us, imposed on us by further coercion, by depriving our women and children of food, and effectively starving us to the to to the peace peace treaty table, uh, and it was the, the the policy of sustaining the blockade was a cause of very very great bitterness in Germany uh, throughout the twenties and into the thirties, and, and fed Hitler's propaganda. Oh, I think quite a lot. I, I mean, students I meet in England tell me that. Uh, my books are on their reading list, and I think they are in the United States as well. No. I would like to know. I'm always wondering quite how many books I have sold. <laughs> no, I, I... It's something that's on my list of things to do, uh, I, to find out how many books I have sold. Well, that's a very important question. Um... Uh, I think that we, uh, uh, until, until D-Day, until June 1944, Hitler always deployed both the best, both the bulk of his armies and the best of his armies against the Russians. Uh, and on the other fronts, say in Italy and in, in North Africa, uh, the, the numbers were fewer and the number of elite formations was fewer also. However, after June 1944, when he had to fight the Allies on the mainland continent of Europe, uh, increasingly it was the Americans and the British who found themselves up against the, the best of the German formations. Not equal numbers, but um, a disproportionate number of Hitler's armoured divisions, panzer divisions, because uh, the Americans and the British were mechanised to a degree that the Russians were not, and in a way Hitler had to send his tanks to fight the British and Americans if he was going to stave off uh, an early disaster. Um, but I know what you're getting at, and you're right to do so, which is that uh, the heaviest of the fighting, co consistently the heaviest of the fighting, was on the Eastern Front rather than on the Western Front. But that is not to say that some of the battles on the Western Front were not as uh, extreme as some of those fought on the, on the Eastern Front. Well, if I knew where Saddam was, I think that I would be... My, I'd be very much sought after by the Western intelligence organisations. I don't know where Saddam is. Uh, it's widely felt within the coalition forces in, in Iraq, that he's still somewhere in the, what's called the Sunni Triangle, north of, uh, northwest and north of uh, Baghdad, around his old uh, uh, home area of Tikrit, and is being passed from place to place, uh, often uh, moving every few hours. Um, and I think that's perfectly possible. Uh, the, the, uh, the people who are causing the trouble uh, are clearly a acting under inspiration, I think, 
and that it's most likely that they are in contact with Saddam, so maybe he's still inside Iraq. If not, um, it's difficult to know where he could have gone because I don't think any government wishes to be identified, take the risk of being identified as hiding Saddam or even um, providing the territory on which he, which he is hiding. So the theory is, for example, it's been said that he might be in Yemen or in Somalia. Um, they're, they're all, they're, they're, they all have difficulties about them as explanations. Um, experts say that Saddam is extremely careful of his own safety and therefore it's most unlikely that he's gone to such a, a lawless country as Somalia where uh, every man's hand is so easily turns against others and where he might easily get murdered. I don't know is the answer. I simply don't know. Um, if I had to put money down, I'd guess that he's still somewhere in Iraq, but I can't guess any better than that. No, it doesn't surprise me, because war is a masculine subject, not a feminine subject. It, it uh, often, in fact, usually does surprise me that I have women readers, although I know I have women readers. And when I give lectures, I'm always both surprised but uh, pleased to find women in the audience asking me questions. And women very often ask the most perceptive questions. Uh, I, I, I think it undoubtedly did. Uh, I'd like to say it was the chief factor in uh, uh, bringing them to accept defeat, resign themselves to defeat, and uh, uh, adopt uh, a post-war stance of total non-resistance, which they did. I think they'd had such a terrible time uh, under bombing that they, they simply relieved that it was over and they did not wish anything to... Uh, they, they didn't wish to help with anything that might start uh, such violence up again. Um, after all, uh, the, the, the British and Americans had um, destroyed uh, Almost every, the centre of every major city in Germany had been destroyed by bombing by 1945. In, in Japan, uh, a, a hundred of the major urban areas in Japan had been completely obliterated by American bombing, mainly incendiary bombing. Uh, it, it appalling damage had been done by, by what's known as conventional bombing, quite apart from the, from the atomic bombs. And it's, it's just not the least bit surprising that the Germans and the Japanese people wanted to give in. My, they are 41, uh, 40, and twins of 38. They're all in England, although my elder daughter, who is 41, is married to uh, an American. He's now become a British citizen, but he was... He's a New Yorker. Uh, none of them are writers. One is a scientist. That's my elder son. He's a scientist at Oxford. Uh, uh, my younger daughter is an actress, rather a successful actress. My younger son is a, is a journalist, but he's a, uh, an editor rather than a writing journalist. And uh, my 41-year-old elder daughter was a journalist and a writing journalist, but. She subsequently had five children, so has, has her hands full otherwise. Well, it's a, it's a very good question, but it's a very big question. Um, I think that uh, uh, Washington and his Confederates had uh, uh, done a pretty good job in, uh, in bringing the British armies in North America to a standstill. Uh, but the, 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 the actual the thing that precipitated the surrender at Yorktown was undoubtedly the intervention of the French and American fleets uh, uh, and their winning of the Battle of the Virginia Capes in 1781, just before the surrender at Yorktown. Um, it, it was a, one of the few times in the 18th century when the Royal Navy was clearly defeated 
uh, by an enemy fleet and um, it persuaded the high command, the British high command, that uh, the army, the, the, the British army at Yorktown couldn't safely be supported any longer and would probably ought, or probably ought to uh, seek terms from the Americans and so that's what happened. It's about 25 miles south of Bath, which uh, uh, that beautiful Georgian city which so many uh, uh, Americans visit when they're in England. It's about 30 miles west of Salisbury, the great cathedral city, where, uh, which again so many Americans also visit. Um, it's in the depths of the country. I'm going, uh, we're going upstairs to my, to my study now, well, about 10 hours a day, 8 hours a day at least. Uh, it's where I uh, I sit at my desk and uh, uh, with a pen in my hand. Sometimes the pen isn't moving across the paper, but quite often it is. One of my books. Um, yes, I am because uh, I find it quicker uh, not to write articles, but to, to write books. I find it quicker to use a pen uh, because you can use your other hand to uh, to deal with other, you know, with paperwork and look th looking things up. That's the view out of my window, down the garden, view out to Salisbury Plain. I look out towards a, uh, an Iron Age uh, hill fort uh, where the former inhabitants of this bit of countryside uh, shut themselves off from their enemies about 2,000 years ago. Uh, there's some Bronze Age fortification too, so 4,000 years old. No, no. As soon as I start, as soon as I, I, I think, you know, I, I try and think of some way of starting each morning and uh, as soon as I do, the pen flows pretty, pretty steadily over the paper. Mm. Maybe five hours, I think. Oh, well, I will stop. I'll, I'll get up and have a walk about, or I'll go and get myself a drink or something or other. But uh, yes, I'm writing a book about the war in Iraq. And that is Lindsay, my secretary, who, my assistant, who can turn my handwriting into the most beautiful typewriting. And, and she's a, she's an absolute, she's a, 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 a master. Um, uh, a master interpreter. I didn't see which one that was. I think it was Oscar. Oscar is a very dangerous cat. He bit me once and nearly took the top off one of my fingers. So um, uh, we have two other cats, which are American cats, Maine Coons, which are delightful. Oscar is an English farm cat and very dangerous. She's a biographer. She has uh, written bi biographies of uh, Alma Mahler, who was married to Gustav Mahler, the, and then also married to um, uh, Walter Gropius and um, um, uh, sorry, the names escapes me at the moment. Um, and then she wrote a life of Oscar Kokoschka, the painter. Do you know that that is too technical a question for me to answer? I'm sorry, I can't. I can't help you with your novel. I, 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 I apologise. Well, now, let me say it right at the start that I'm a tremendous admirer of the Dupuis. There are two of them, father and son. And uh, I think their chief work, their great work, is their Encyclopedia of Mil Military History, uh, which I, I have on my second copy. I, I, I've, I've used it so much. The first one wore out. Um, it's about 1,100 pages, and it is a... a I think a total compendium of the wars of the world from the beginning of time to the present day uh, in every part of the world and every country. It's an absolutely extraordinary book and uh, indispensable. Uh, having said that, I, let me say that I don't follow uh, Dupuis Senior in this uh, attempt to reduce human performance in combat to uh, a formula. I just think it's too difficult. I think there are too many, too many factors. Well done is I, I th had the idea that um, it would be useful and profitable to to produce a reference book about the, all the armies of the world because it was at a time uh, towards the end of the Cold War when armies were uh, 
uh, very important uh, agents of uh, disturbance and change in world affairs. And I, I simply thought that there were many, many people, from journalists to uh, politicians, who would need such a reference book. And I devoted a great deal of time to it. And I enlisted the help of um, many colleagues. And we did, in fact, produce. Uh, nobody's ever done anything else like it. It's unique. Uh, but it was not, unfortunately. It was, the idea was that it should become an annual publication. In fact, it was only published in two editions. And so my idea did not succeed, but I continue to think that it was a good one. Not at all, I regard the Ottomans as one of the most important military people in history. Yes, the first part of your question is easier to answer than the second. Um, the, um, the Ottomans were uh, an absolutely extraordinary military people and uh, I suppose unique in their time. Um, al although I don't see how you could have replicated their military organisation elsewhere because uh, it depended upon the power of both the power of religion and the absolute power of the Ottoman Sultan as ruler. Um, he, the, the Ottoman Sultan was also caliph. He was the head of the faithful. Uh, and uh, all Sunni Muslims were supposed to follow his authority. They were, well, um, Shia Muslims too, but they didn't uh, recognize him as caliph. Um, so he had, so he had a, 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 a religious element to his leadership. He also, as, as sultan the mo and the most powerful ruler in the world, uh, in, uh, with the exception, perhaps, of the emperor of China, uh, he had uh, a power beyond, beyond that of any Christian king. Um, and he used it to create a very extraordinary army in which the most important elements were actually slaves. It sounds odd, and it was odd, but they were recruited from the horse peoples of, the, of Central Asia as boys, and they were trained uh, in military arts in, in Constantinople, in Istanbul, and they then became the military slaves of the, the Sultan with enormous privileges. So there was, this was reconciled the the sort of anomaly of slaves having military power. They were, they were slaves, but they enjoyed tremendous privileges. And they also fought with incredible tenacity. They, the Europeans, I think the, the, the Christians of the 15th and 16th century, I often think, believed that they were confronted by the power of the devil when they met, when they met the Ottomans. They, they fought with such disregard for, for their own safety with such, and with such pitiless cruelty. But anyhow, in their heyday, which went on, well, from the 14th century AD to the beginning of the 18th century, they, the, the Ottomans were almost literally unstoppable. Well, it's very, very kind of you to wish me well, and I'm encouraged by, by these, uh, uh, this news of... Uh, your sister and others um, about the sh about the scuttling. Yes, of course. Um, the the British had taken the the, the German battle fleet up to its own uh, battle fleet anchorage in the north of Scotland at Scapa Flow uh, at the end of the war. That was one of the conditions of the armistice that the Germans should send their major ships up to Scapa Flow or should c c hand them over to the British. Uh, but they were left with their own crews aboard. And when it became clear, and this we've discussed earlier on the programme, when it became clear that the Allies uh, were going to impose their own terms on the Germans by sustaining the blockade, it was decided uh, within the fleet, uh, within the German fleet at Scapa Flow, that they wouldn't allow the British to get possession of their ships. So they opened uh, the seacocks, let let the sea in, and the ships all settled on the bottom. Um, it was the most sensational world, new, world news, um, and um, 
there they remained for some of them are still there but uh, there was a great salvage operation in the, in the 20s and 30s to get them up again but they were ruined as ships and they simply went to be broken up gosh i almost require notice of that question uh, uh, well i think that other people would choose the face of battle um, uh, and I do have to say that the, that the face of battle is a, is a very good read. It, it continues to, you know, it, you can pick it up and it flows along. Uh, the, book, uh, uh, the book into which I put m more of myself than any other book, I really, really worked at it and it was a great effort on, on my part. The history of warfare, yes. Um, Hmm. Well, you know, the, the, people, have, historians have funny tastes. Uh, one of my favourite... I don't think it would do a lot for other people, but it did an enormous amount for me. A funny little book called Gunpowder and Galleys by my friend John Gwilmartin, who used to be a professor at the uh, US Air Force Acab Academy at, at Colorado Springs. And it's an account of uh, galley warfare in the Mediterranean in the 16th century. But it's also uh, a general analysis of the nature of naval warfare. And it's also a very acute analysis of the cultural uh, elements in warfare between Christians and Muslims. It's therefore of tremendous relevance to the present moment. Gil Martin, Gil Martin, G U I L M A R T I N, John Gil Martin, usually known as Joe Gil Martin, ex Colonel, United States Air Force, Gunpowder and Galleys. Yes, I do think the face of battle has changed. Uh, one of the reasons being the nature of modern small arms. Uh, one of the things I think the most hor that most horrifies us about war today is that uh, uh, high-minded, well-trained uh, Western soldiers uh, who've been instructed in the laws of war and in the proper behaviour uh, of uh, uh, the, the, the legitimate defenders of their countries come up against ch child soldiers, they come up against 11-year-olds uh, who uh, have un uh, undeveloped consciences. Uh, after all, what does, what does a child know about the sanctity of human life or about the rule of law or about any of those things which uh, an adult raised in a proper military training system does know about? Uh, and this child has a Kalashnikov. And with a Kalashnikov, he can kill uh, 50 people in a few seconds. And what's awful is that sometimes these child soldiers do kill 50 people in a few seconds in, in these awful episodes in African civil war, for example, in the, in the war between the Hutsis and the, uh, and the Tutsi, Hutus and the Tutsi. We did have massacres of this sort. And the extravagance of modern firepower makes many of the ideas I advanced in the face of battle irrelevant, redundant. That, that warfare isn't uh, a, sm a, a small, uh, unformed human being uh, can overcome uh, a, a, a much more responsible and more highly trained human being and all the qualities which the the the, the legitimate soldier deploys are are uh, they're wiped out by this transformation in in the uh, in the nature of firepower i've well i've three times lived for quite long periods in the united states I've been, uh, as you say, I came here on a travelling scholarship in 1957, uh, mainly visiting the South, uh, visited most of the Civil War battlefields. 84, I was a fellow of Princeton, and 97, I was a professor at Vassar. 
And besides that, uh, I visited the United States dozens and dozens of times and been to many of the, uh, well, many of the lower 48. I have also been to Hawaii, so I've been outside the lower 48 as well. I counted up. Um, I think I've been to between 30 and 40 of the states. Uh, but I'd like to say, since you've given me the opportunity, that I'm a tremendous admirer of, of the United States and of Americans and of America. And um, uh, I never miss an opportunity in my own country uh, of saying so. I, I believe I, I'm deeply grateful in my own life for what uh, America has done for me personally and for my country. Well, I th think I'd need more information about your first point. I, 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 it's, it's, I'm unfamiliar with it. I don't think that the... Uh, I've never heard of the United States government uh, uh, encouraging illegal or improper behaviour in institutions of public education. Uh, what I meant by a legitimate uh, soldier is, is somebody raised within the sort of training system that you have in this country and in my own country where soldiers uh, are very clearly instructed in their duties and in, uh, uh, and in the, the proprieties of the, the legalities of warfare where they are taught the difference between a legal command and an illegal command where, where they're taught about the difference between proper conduct and improper conduct and I, 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 that is, I, I think soldiers in the, in the United States Army and in the British Army uh, uh, by the time they've completed their training know uh, when they are allowed to use their weapons and when they are not allowed to use their weapons and that is really that is what makes a legitimate soldier. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, two very interesting points. Of course you're quite right about the world nature of World War I. Uh, it wasn't just fought in France and Belgium. Uh, there was an important front in Italy too, and the Italians... Uh, I think the, one of the reasons why the Italians did so badly in the Second World War was because they had exhausted themselves of the First World War. They'd suffered appalling casualties, over half a million dead, fighting the Austrians and the Germans, mainly up in the mountains of uh, what's now modern Yugoslavia and uh, northern Italy. Um, it was fought on the eastern front, fought in Russia on a very large scale uh, in a front that existed uh, in the Caucasus, right, ran down into the Caucasus uh, and there were sporadic campaigns in Russian Central Asia as well. It's also fought in Africa. There was a, a very, very skillful German guerrilla leader called uh, von Lettoff Vorbeck who c led the the, the British and the French and the Belgians and others a merry dance all over East Africa. It was fought in the German West African colonies. It was fought in the Pacific, where the Germans conducted a cruiser warfare campaign in 1914. Um, and uh, there was even fighting on the mainland of China, where the, uh, the Japanese and the British uh, extinguished the German naval base at Tsingtao. So it was a genuine world war about why the French take this hostile attitude to the English-speaking peoples, I, I don't think it actually had too much to do with the sinking of the French fleet at Marcel Kabir. It caused, that caused a lot of bitterness at the time, but it was soon forgotten. I think it has more to do with the fact that uh, the French have never really recovered from what they call the terrible year. Uh, L'année terrible of 1940, uh, where they were humiliated as a state and a people. And for all that de Gaulle tried to do, you know, he tried, he argued after August 1944 that the French had liberated themselves, a reference to the role of the resistance. Uh, it, was t it was too exaggerated a statement. I don't think he believed it, and I don't think the French believed it. The French knew that they had been liberated by the Americans from the British, and they could not forgive the, French, the, the Americans and the British for having done something which they knew should never have been necessary, that the, 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 uh, France should not have been defeated in 1940. It should have uh, 
been able to defend itself, it wasn't, and it was a humiliation to have that terrible mistake retrieved by people from across the sea, and that is at the root of this hostility the French have for the English-speaking people. Let me, let me try and... I, I think it's a very interesting enterprise of yours. Uh, of course, the, the American Civil War did produce uh, some of the greatest of American poetry through the work of Walt Whitman. I find Whitman, uh, on the personal experience of uh, the Civil War, deeply, deeply moving. Uh, uh, he was a dresser. He worked as a, as a medical assistant in, uh, in hospitals. Uh, he saw suffering at first hand, uh, and he knew what suffering meant both to the wounded man and to their families. And uh, I, I, I'm unable ever to read uh, Come Up From The Fields, Father, without feeling the onset of tears. I think it's a, a, a poem which uh, anybody who thinks or writes about war should know more or less by heart, because it does, does uh, convey in 20 or 30 lines exactly how agonizing it is, more so for those who stay behind than for those who go to war. Yes, I do wish I could have kept off the Irving case. I tried hard not to appear in court. Um, I regarded my opinion of, uh, uh, of uh, Irving's book, Hitler's War, as a, as a more or less as a private one. Um, and I did very, very much didn't want to be associated publicly with Irving because I knew that public association with Irving only leads to trouble, and that email is a perfect example of why it only leads to trouble, because it is n not possible to frame remarks about Irving in a way which... Uh, reasoned remarks in a way which doesn't give offence to, to Zionists or uh, uh, philo-Semites or whatever one likes to call them. Um, but still, I stand by my judgment that Irving is a very interesting writer and that his book, Hitler's War, is a very important book. And I uh, equally stand by my judgment that all, all Lipstadt said was that um, Irving has unpleasant and indefensible positions, but we all agree with that. Everybody knows that to be the case. I know it to be the case. I regard most of a lot of uh, I regard a lot of Irving's uh, opinions as uh, reprehensible, but I'm simply because I regard some of his opinions, many of his opinions, are reprehensible. I am not going to say that he is a bad historian, because he is not a bad historian. He is a very good historian who happens to have some repugnant views. That's all. Well, um, I'm delighted to uh, hear your familiar accent, and I suspect that your father, if he fought in the First World War, probably fought in... Uh, a regiment like the Black Watch or the, the Gordon Highlanders. Um, it's difficult to give advice about uh, personal manuscripts without seeing them. Um, there's certainly uh, a, a great interest still in the First World War in Scotland, and I suspect if you want to make a start that you should uh, uh, perhaps send it to the Scottish National War Museum in Edinburgh. Oh, because... As I think often happens with um, what's effectively a de degenerative condition, you're fine for a long time, uh, and you, then suddenly you start to get worse quite quickly. Uh, you know, and I, indeed I can feel myself getting worse almost <laughs> by the week. Um, when I, I mean, when I was at Vassar in 1997, which is only six years ago, I was still able to travel easily all over the United States. Um, now I travel with difficulty. Well, I, I, that's a, a very perceptive point, and um, may I thank you for mentioning the name of Victor Davis Hanson, who uh, is uh, an American uh, historian of the ancient world. He's a professor at uh, uh, the University of California, 
Uh, and uh, uh, although I've never met him, I regard him as a close friend because we've written to each other a great deal. Uh, Victor Davis is, uh, I think, uh, absolutely right about uh, uh, the, the, the nature of the difference between Western military culture and Asiatic, Asian military culture. Um, whether it was Mongol or whether it was um, Ottoman, it d d stemmed from their extraordinary mastery of the horse, particularly the small uh, step pony ridden without saddle or stirrups. Um, the, 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 the Mongols and the Turks simply, they were, they were almost part of their horses, um, and because they, because they were brought up in the saddle, lived on the step, uh, lived very hard and frugal lives. They, they, there was little difference for them between being at peace and being at war. They, their, their life was equally hard either way, and that may, meant that the Westerners found them very, very difficult to, to uh, get the better of. Uh, it was only eventually when the West had developed superior systems of drill and discipline uh, that they found a means of uh, breaking, uh, well, it was by then Ottoman power. It wasn't so much weapons. The, the, the Ottomans had equivalent weapons, but um, by the time the Allies, oh, sorry, by the time the, the, the West had uh, mastered the modern technique of drill, uh, they did have a secret which the, the, the horse peoples of the steppe uh, couldn't match. Well, I think it sold very well, I believe. Um, the, the publishers, uh, Knopf and um, my publishers, Hutchinson in England, um, wanted to... The, the First World War had sold very well, so they thought they'd do an illustrated version, which meant uh, reducing the text from 200,000 words to under 100,000 words, uh, which effectively meant completely rewriting it, and also writing um, 40 or 50,000 words of long captions, because the, all the illustrations had to be explained. So it was a considerable labour, but I greatly enjoyed it. I, 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 uh, I don't remember the, the producing the, the, the illustrated history of the First World War was really an effort. I, I, it seemed to go very easily. Ah, I, well, I think... I think I'll say at, at once that there's no parallel with the British experience in India, because apart from the Indian Mutiny of 1857, which was a very particular sort of uh, conflict, and not a conflict with, between an army and a people, but a conflict between two armies, uh, I don't think I don't think India has I don't think that you can make any comparison at all between India and the conflict in Israel and the conflict conflict in in South Africa between the British and the Boers. Uh, I don't really think that the uh, the Israeli Palestinian conflict is comparable with the British Boer conflict in South Africa because. Uh, the whole problem in Palestine or in Israel is whether the Palestinians are to have a state or not. Whereas in, in, in South Africa in 19, 1899, when the war between the British and the Boers broke out, the Boers had two internationally recognised states of their own, the Orange Free State and the, and the Transvaal Republic. They were, they were legitimate, uh, their governments were legitimate sovereign governments, uh, which actually attacked... Uh, the British colonies of Natal and, and uh, Cape Province. Uh, uh, the war that resulted was a war between the British Empire and these two small Boer republics, Transvaal and Orange Free State, which the, the, the Boers gradually lost. Uh, but my goodness, they gave the British a difficult time until they were eventually overcome. They, 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 carried on the war by, the, by regular means or irregular means for three years. What's happening in Israel is, of course, entirely different, and no, absolutely nobody. I think, I think there are as many opinions about Israel and Palestine as there are individuals in the world, so wh whatever I say would be 
uh, one opinion among hundreds and hundreds of thousands. Uh, however, um, I, I don't think I don't think it would be generally contested that it, the whole issue is whether the Palestinians should be allowed to have a state of their own, and whether the Israelis are justified in denying them a state. Um, uh, anyhow, the, 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 the contesting that issue is painful and bloody and creates great anguish both in the wider world and in Israel and in Palestine and uh, it would be foolish to say where one's where one's sympathies where one's sympathies lie um, and very difficult very difficult indeed to say where one's sympathies lie I was brought up in the Second World War um, from an early age, I was aware, as I, did, as I think any, any European must have been, of the appalling experience of the Jews under the Nazis uh, that had inevitably a very strong formative influence on my outlook uh, on the world. On the other hand, one's ex extremely aware of the sense of injustice that the Palestinians have and Ah, uh, well, I, um, I, I, didn't, I didn't quite hear whose mistake it was. I think you said Hitler's mistakes. Um, if, if, if that is what you said, um, I think Hitler's real mistake, if he wanted to win, was not to have uh, organised, planned and organised his, his scientific programme better than he did. Uh, Germany made was enormously successful uh, in the development of critical military technology between um, well 1936 say and, and 1944. By 1944, the Germans had the following te technological achievements to their credit: they had built and flown the first helicopter, they had built and flown the first jet aircraft. They had built and flown the first cruise missile, and they had built and flown the first extra atmospheric missile, the V2. Uh, but all these weapons were either not fully developed or would, came too late into production. Secondly, Hitler had made very, very slow progress with the development of nuclear weapons. He had made some progress, but not enough, partly because of his per persecution of Jewish scientists, which meant that the talent which might have been available to him had gone abroad, had fled abroad in most cases. Uh, and uh, secondly, because he was parsimonious with the money and spent it inefficiently. There were, I think, 12 separate agencies who were supposed to be developing nuclear weapons in Nazi Germany, and as a result, None of them got enough support and none of them got enough money. Um, had he developed a nuclear weapon and had either the, the cruise missile, the V-1, or the, the rocket, the V-2, in production early enough, he would have won the war. He would have bombarded London, he would have bombarded the, the invasion ports. D-Day couldn't have taken place. He would have uh, d d destroyed the American armies in Britain. Um, three questions, really, uh, and all very acute ones. Uh, the last one, highly sensitive. Uh, I think President Reagan quite deliberately set out to bankrupt the Soviet Union by uh, heightening, uh, requiring the Soviets to follow him in increasing military spending knowing that that would be uh, that, that, that American military spending could be driven up to levels which the Soviets couldn't couldn't reach uh, and he was I, I think quite open about it uh, that was his policy and it worked uh, that was why the the Soviet economic system uh, began to break down and why uh, the followers of Brezhnev notably Gorbachev um, had to, in effect to come to the West and say um, well, could you please agree terms on which we can cease to compete? It's one of the most successful non-military strategies that has ever been pursued. Um, 
about the war on terror as a real war, question mark. Um, no, I don't think it's a real war, but then there's never been anything like it before. Uh, we've never had a situation in which uh, anti-state organizations, which are not themselves states, can uh, deploy military force at the uh, level which Al-Qaeda and other terrorist organizations do. Um, uh, and, of course, it's, they're not exactly waging war, but they can stage acts of war. I mean, the attack on the Twin Towers, uh, September the 11th, was an act of war, even if it wasn't part of a war, if that doesn't sound illogical. Um, and because they can stage acts of war, it requires their enemies to behave as if they were in a, themselves in a state of war, if you follow me. Um, and that's to go on to your third point, which is a sensitive one. It, 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 as far as I'm concerned, the United States is... It, it is perfectly legitimate for the United States to treat servants of the international terrorist organisations uh, as uh, combatants uh, without... Uh, uh, without legal protection. I know that that's a hard thing to say and a harsh thing to say, but they are... They have, a, they have entered into a state of war with the United States or into the... They've uh, entered into the commission of acts of war against the United States without... Um, uh, taking any of the legal positions, the, the uh, statutory positions, which combatants normally do, uh, wearing uniforms, uh, giving notice of their, of their intended actions, etc., etc., etc. They have chosen to behave illegally, and if they're therefore treated by the United States as beyond the law, then that is their affair. It, it shouldn't concern the international legal system, in my view. Well, thank you. And I'm always grateful for new information, and I'm afraid I hadn't heard about this wall in Nigeria, but, uh, of, of course, I'm not surprised to hear that it exists because um, um, we're forever discovering uh, uh, new things about uh, the past. And uh, a wall in Nigeria was exactly the sort of thing one would expect would be there simply hadn't been found before. Um, uh, there, there, there were, by the way, other fortifications in, in, in Africa, which I should have been. I, I think I meant that there weren't long, systematic fortifications like the Great Wall of China. Um, there, there were small um, point fortifications in Africa, uh, constructed for various reasons. Um, so, well, thank you, and I will, if I get round to doing a second edition of A History of Warfare, I will upgrade, as you urge me to do so. Well, um, there's an awful lot in, the, in, in that, that question of yours. Uh, I think what you're really uh, focusing on is the, is the existence and role of minorities in the Middle East. Uh, and... It's so difficult for people from countries like the United States and Britain uh, to understand how, how contentious minority politics are because uh, we both... Uh, our experience is entirely, really, of unified populations. The United States has one of the most culturally unified populations in, in the world and in world history. And despite the fact that Britain... Is, divides into four with Irish, Scots, English and Welsh, where uh, we are culturally one because we all speak English and uh, uh, our cultural differences are much less important than our cultural similarities. But to go to a country like Iraq, as you mentioned, and, and um, uh, you immediately find, as you've pointed out, you have to deal with Kurds, 
who are not Arabs at all, but are ethnically Iranian, and whose language is more akin to Iranian than it is to Arabic, and then two important religious subdivisions of the Arab people, the, the Sunnis of the center, and the much more numerous uh, Shia of the south, who uh, do not agree about religion at all, don't even agree about the nature of authority in Islam. Uh, if I could sort of stand back from your point of view, and it applies to what you had to say about Palestine and what you had to say about Lebanon as well, I think it's very easy for Westerners to see what looks like the sensible thing to do, uh, the objectively reasonable thing to do, and say, right, that's it, Th this is the reasonable thing to do, and so that's the solution, and you, Kurds, Sudi, Shia, Palestinians, Israelis, Syrians or Lebanese, if you don't like it, then you must accept that you're in the wrong. They won't think like that. They'll simply revert to their minority positions and you'll be back where you started. You have to find some way, if it's possible, of trying to involve them in, involve them in, the, in the solution not in dictating the solution to them from the outside. I am indeed, I have a contract to do so, and uh, I have begun work on it, and I hope to publish it in uh, 2005. Uh, I'm not sure that I made notes in 1957, but uh, I've certainly, I've visited the, I was only 23, I think, in the, I was, uh, uh, and I was, so busy getting to know America and enjoying myself that I, I don't think I was very systematic about my visits to the battlefields, but uh, I've made many, many subsequent visits and I certainly do have notes. Uh, I, in 1994, uh, I made a visit to the battlefields of Northern Virginia in the company of the then head of U.S., the head chief of U.S. military, his army chief of U.S. military history, who uh, gave me the, the most brilliant tour of the battlefields, particularly Chancellorsville, which I made detailed notes and which I've never forgotten. Well, um, I, of course, I, I think I've made it clear that I, I find um, many, if, uh, I, well, that I, that I find Irving, whenever he gets on to the subject of uh, the, the treatment of the Jews or the experience of the Jews, the suffering of the Jews uh, in, the, in the 30s and 40s in the, in the Nazi period, I find him repugnant. Uh, and I do not agree with him, of course not. Uh, but you, I think listening to you, uh, or somebody who hasn't read Hitler's War, which is the only book of his I'm really interested in, uh, somebody listening to you talking about uh, uh, his so-called distortion, his, well, they are undoubted distortions, his distortion, etc., would imagine that that is what Hitler's war is about. But Hitler's war is, in fact, about Hitler as a military commander fighting an enormous war against first the Russians and then the British and the Americans. And the, uh, uh, the, 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 the amount of space devoted to uh, Hitler's tr treatment of... Uh, the, 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 his Jewish victims or uh, any of his other European victims is, is minute, it's tiny. Uh, you, you've completely distort, distorted the, the relative importance of, uh, Hit, of, of Irving's treatment of Hitler as military commander and Hitler as persecutor of the Jews. In that book, in that book only, which is what I'm talking about, his his overwhelmingly large focus is on Hitler as a military commander and he is extremely interesting and important on Hitler's performance as a military commander. That's all I'd say. Well, now, it's very interesting you ask that question because I think uh, that the, 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 the fate of the loyalists, the, the fate of the loyalists, as they're called, um, is, a, is, is an undercovered subject. Um, about a th as we know, is about a third of the population of the, th the 13 colonies were either actively or passively pro-British. 
that's the usual calculation. About a third were were rebels uh, or patriots. About a third were indifferent, tried to keep out of it, and about a third were loyalists. Uh, you can argue with the details, but that's usually that's the proportions usually estimated. Uh, when the British lost and left America, uh, some of the loyalists made their peace with the new uh, government. Uh, some went to Canada, where they became the uh, the, the the Empire loyalists, uh, and uh, some went back to Britain. Some were genuine Americans. They weren't never been to Britain, but some went to Britain all the same. For example, two of the captains uh, who commanded ships in Nelson's fleet at the Battle of the Nile in 1798, one of Nelson's three great victories, were New Yorkers. Uh, and one of them, I think, went on to, to fight at the Battle of Trafalgar. And numbers of them went on to serve as officers in the... East India Com Company's army in, in India, what would later become the Indian army. Um, and there, 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 is a, there is a lot of information about the, the Americans in the, in the East India Company's army. But I don't think, I think you're right, I don't think uh, the, the story of the loyalists after the war and the revolution, after the defeat of the British, uh, has been well enough told. It's certainly not well enough known. I think it's a fascinating story. Well, now, um, with a name like Keegan, you may guess I am of Irish ancestry, which indeed I am. Uh, you may not guess, but I will tell you that I, if anything, even more reluctant to uh, talk about uh, the troubles in Northern Ireland than I am to talk about troubles in is Israel or uh, David Irving. I think they're, they're such uh, ir 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 irresoluble irresolvable, contentious conflicts that uh, I really tried to have as little to do with them as I possibly can. Um, I would say one thing, which is that, you know, every cloud has a silver lining, they say, and if September the 11th had a single good uh, effect, it was that it knocked terrorism on the head in Ireland. Uh, September the 11th has given terrorism such a bad name in Europe that the the, the former terrorist groups, uh, and in Ireland that meant the Irish Republican Army and the various Protestant paramilitary groups, dare not, dare not commit terrorist acts because of American disapproval. Uh, behaving in any way like Al-Qaeda, they know will att attract uh, the, the forthright condemnation of uh, the American government and of American public opinion, and they don't risk that. About books to read on the Irish Troubles, um, uh, th there are two writers, both uh, both over. Uh, sympathetic to the IRA, but important nonetheless. They know a great deal about the IRA. Well, one an American called J. Bowyer Bell, and the other an Irishman called Tim Pat Coogan. Uh, but you, there, there are um, also works by Protestant historians. Um, Roy Foster, in particular, the the uh, the uh, professor of Irish history at Oxford. Uh, which should be read as a balance. Well, that's a very apposite question. The, the, the agreement to which you refer uh, is called the Sykes-Picot Agreement of um, either 1915 or 1916. Sykes was a British diplomat, so was Picot, a French diplomat. Um, they agreed to create zones of influence, if not of authority, in the post-war Middle East, uh, which roughly allotted uh, Syria and Lebanon to the French, uh, Palestine, Jordan and Iraq to the British. Uh, meanwhile, however, they were, and this is, I think, the, 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 the cause, this is what 
has, has caused Arab suspicion and and uh, uh, post-war discontent. Meanwhile, they were promising the same territory uh, to the followers of the Sharif of Mecca, the Hashemite ruler, or the Hashemite head of family, uh, who was uh, joining with Lawrence of Arabia, you've got his name right, T. Lawrence, uh, in raising revolt against the Ottoman Empire. Uh, so it, uh, right back at the beginning, there was double dealing. But I don't think that's the, the ultimate cause of the trouble. I mean, the, 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 had there not been uh, the Balfour Declaration and had there not been fairly large-scale Jewish immigration into the Middle East, uh, I think the Middle East would probably, probably not be... A, the, tr the trouble zone that it is. That's a diff dangerous, dangerous uh, calculation to suggest, but uh, it's, uh, as I began, as I said earlier when talking about minorities, I mean, the problem in the Middle East is minorities. It's not boundaries, uh, um, uh, and it's not natural resources either. Well, uh, very, very interesting but for me sensitive question uh, like you I'm a friend of the Stauffenberg family I, although I don't know uh, that side I, um, I'm a friend of uh, Klaus von Stauffenberg the eldest son and his wife uh, Mechthild uh, I've stayed with them in Germany they've stayed with us in England um, they make a family visit to Germany from wherever they are in the world every year on July the 20th. There's a, there's a family commemoration of the bomb plot. Um, you're quite right, nevertheless, to indicate that uh, not all Germans regard Klaus von Stauffenberg Sr., the father, as a national hero. Um, uh, they... Uh, they feel that uh, to act against the head of state, even if the head of state was Hitler, during a war was in some way uh, a breach of military honor. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, not expressing an opinion. I'm merely saying that I know that that is what is felt. Uh, it is one of the most difficult of all issues in the life of soldiers in the in the life of uh, states. What action is justified against a ruler who is clearly in breach of the law of his own country and the law of nations? It's an anthology uh, which I'd been asked to do by uh, an American editor of whom I was very fond, and uh, I, I enjoyed doing it. I tried to give it some shape. I think anthologies, the difficulty with anthologies is that they're very often merely unorganized collections of pieces of writing. And uh, I tried to show a development uh, in the nature of, uh, of war, in the, the personal experience of war, by the way in which I organize the pieces. I, I, with some success, I think I'm not, not making more claim for it than that. Ah, <sighs> golly. Um, in my lifetime, uh, military history has uh, uh, expanded almost like the world economy. Uh, it, it, was a, it was a very, very minor interest uh, and not very well done. When I started out in the, in the 50s, really, uh, and it was very, very difficult as a young military historian to find uh, books that you felt you had to read. The, 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 all, the, the good books were very few in number, and there were big patches. Uh, nothing, almost nothing, had been done on the anthropology of war, for example, which has always been has, and has become uh, even more a great interest of mine. There was very little on. Uh, proper study of uh, uh, armies and governments, 
there was very little about uh, the social aspects of war, particularly things like military medicine, which I think are tremendously important. Um, very little about the, the post-war consequences, particularly how ex-servicemen veterans are treated, and so on. All that now has been done, and there's, there's less and less blank, there are fewer and fewer blank spaces on the map. I really am, I really cannot think of a, 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 an untreated or under-treated subject. Uh, perhaps that'll stimulate uh, callers to telephone in and uh, remind me of things I've forgotten. Well, she's a very clever girl, and I think she should stick at the study of history because she's uh, put her finger on something absolutely crucial right away. Um, the tendency of bad people to rise to the top uh, is, of course, not a new idea, but she puts it very well. Um, why it happens is a p perennial mystery. Uh, who was it who said, uh, in order for evil to triumph, it is only necessary for good men to do nothing? Uh, I don't think it was Burke, although it is a Burkean idea. Uh, but, of course, that, that's the point. Uh, most people, um, historians, of course, like uh, historians concentrate on uh, the d dangerous, the disreputable, the regrettable, in exactly the same way as journalists concentrate on uh, uh, divorces and not happy marriages. I mean, happy marriages are news, divorces are news. Um, uh, but that's unrepresentative. I mean, even there, there is, even in, 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 in the United States or the, uh, my own country where there's such a high divorce rate, nevertheless, there are more stable marriages than unstable marriages. Um, and there Although there's a, a dreadful lot of dissent and, and contention in the world, there is also an enormous amount of cooperation and tranquility and harmony. Uh, and I think that should always be set against the, the sort of thing that gets into the history books. 43 years this December, May the 15th, not particularly. <laughs> but there's not much you can do about it, is there? <laughs> Thank you. Well, I, I hope that it's uh, been, been stored in an archive, either at the RAF Museum at Hendon or perhaps at the Imperial War Museum. Uh, the trouble is that historical material uh, owned by governments all too easily gets thrown away in a fit of... Uh, House clearing, you know, they, they move, people move offices or the uh, establishments are closed down and uh, somebody says, oh, this, uh, this lot of old paper or this box of old negatives is just cluttering the place up, get rid of it. Uh, I've known that happen, I'm afraid to say, in three or four crucial cases and it's, uh, once you've done it, it can't be retrieved, but I'm afraid it is done. Oh, keep reading. Uh, history is a, is a whatever fashions and fads there have been in my lifetime, and there have been many. Uh, history is a literary subject. History is a is a is a, is a, is a word subject. And uh, at her age, at sixteen, uh, she needn't bother with original documents, with original manuscripts. Let she should read as many printed books of the right sort as she can find. Oh, I'm reading a book, I haven't finished it yet, called Stalin, The Court of the Last Tsar by Simon Seabag Mount Montefiore, which is about the, f it's both a political account of the Bolshevik, the rise to power of the, the rise, the early years of power of the Bolsheviks and a picture of their intimate family life, and it's horrifying. I, I mean, Hit Stalin was arguably a nastier man than Hitler, and uh, 
the account of how he could cultivate his own happiness and his own family life while consigning hundreds of thousands of people, often his own intimates, to horrible treatment in the prison camps in the Gulag is, is, is terrifying. Seabag Montefiore, Sa uh, Simon Seabag Montefiore, uh, it was widely noticed in England. I hope it's, I'm sure it'll be published in the United States. Right. Um, I'll answer the third question last. We have three cats. Oscar, the dangerous one, uh, I don't know where he lives and I can't say I care much. I, I'm, I'm looking at the finger he nearly bit off. Uh, our two lovely American cats, who are called uh, Cecil and Monty, uh, uh, come and go as they please. They spend a lot of time in the house. Uh, being uh, New England cats, they have this enormously thick winter coat. They don't seem to feel the cold, and, and uh, so they're in and out as they choose. About Hitler, um, he wasn't really... Well, I suppose he was appointed, but the point... Hindenburg, as president of Germany, felt obliged to uh, offer him the chancellorship because by that stage, in January 1933, uh, the Nazi party, although a minority party, was in, in that no party had a majority in the, in the, uh, in the, in the German parliament, in the Reichstag, uh, the, the Nazi party had more seats than any of the other parties did. So uh, Hindenburg felt, felt obliged to offer him the chancellorship. Uh, why wasn't Ch Churchill heard? Because his message was uncomfortable as he himself said uh, at the time of Munich, that he couldn't blame what he called the brave British people for being relieved that uh, Chamberlain had signed the Munich Agreement uh, and that uh, Czechoslovakia had been sacrificed to, to German power, but he said, nevertheless, this is a, this is a, 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 a policy for which we will uh, pay a bitter price, we will regret it, uh, and uh, we will wish that we hadn't done it. Uh, but although Churchill was always listened to, he was never shouted down. Curiously, he was shouted down after the war, he was never shouted down before the war. Uh, he was always listened to with respect, and he commanded uh, a serious audience wherever he spoke. But Nevertheless, the British didn't really want to hear him because what he was saying was, uh, despite our economic difficulties, which were many, we must make sacrifices to rearm and we must be ready to fight Germany again as we fought Germany in 1914. And the British didn't want to do that. They only did it when they, there was no alternative in September 1939. Um, this is a subject, to go back to a theme we've discussed already, this is a subject. The influence of the American Civil War on the Europeans is a subject which has been uh, widely studied. There was a wonderful book published in the 1960s uh, called The Military Legacy of the Civil War. Uh, uh, and it studied the, 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 the way in which the Germans, the French and the British uh, studied this, the American Civil War and what they learnt from it. And the conclusion is that they, in their different ways, each of them rejected the lessons of the American Civil War, which were that untrained mass armies could uh, achieve high levels of military efficiency in the field, that uh, industrial power was of ultimately greater importance than military power, etc., etc. And uh, the subject still commands great interest among European military historians. Uh, and the answer is still the same, that the, the Europeans were so immersed in their own experience of warfare and what they, in their own beliefs about warfare, above all that it, uh, wars were won by trained, Long ser longer service armies and uh, professional leaders that they, they couldn't bring themselves to uh, 
accept the evidence of the American Civil War, which was contrary to that. You've skewered me, really. Uh, uh, I find it very, very difficult to disagree with you. But, um, and I'm always uh, trying to get off the hook on this point, but I don't think war is uh, uh, inevitable, uh, uh, and I don't think man is naturally... but is condemned by his nature to fight wars. The way I get out of it is by saying that, of course, all man, mankind, has a, has a capability for violence and a pen potentiality for violence, but is not naturally violent. Now, reconciling those two positions is difficult, but I've spent a lot of my life trying to do it. No, not at all, but might I say that uh, uh, it's a great pleasure to speak to an American doctor, an American physician, because curiously, um, a great deal of my transatlantic mail comes from American doctors uh, 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 who seem to me to have a, a quite remarkable interest in military history. Um, uh, Lee, uh, Lee's health, general health, during the, the Civil War was adequate. Uh, he did, didn't suffer um, any physical or mental... Uh, didn't display any physical or mental... Uh, uh, symptoms in the way that some others did. You know, as for example, Longstreet is alleged to have suffered from a sort of nervous crisis during Gettysburg. Uh, but I don't think I think Lee was frail. But he, you know, his his life after the Civil War was quite brief. Uh, 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 he he wasn't his death wasn't brought about by disease as. Uh, or disorder, as Grant was. Grant died of, of cancer because he was addicted to cigars and uh, had uh, throat cancer. Uh, that's not the case with Lee, but I, I don't think Lee was really physically very strong, and perhaps the trauma of the war uh, and his frailty uh, contributed to his quite uh, abrupt death after the war was over. Thank you very much indeed, and thank all the callers. It's a pleasure to speak to them.